In this session, we're going to deal with temptation. That's the subject. And biblically, temptation is that which allures or entices a person to do that which is wrong, sinful, hurtful, harmful, or evil, either against another man, yourself, or God. Man does not sin because he is tempted, but rather because he chooses to yield to temptation. You see, being tempted does not make a person a sinner. A person's will is never violated, inducing him to sin. When we sin, we yield to temptation by an act of our own free will, violating God's word as well as our conscience. In other words, when a person yields to temptation and consequently sins, it's because they want to. Temptation in the believer's life can be a time of testing for them, which promotes spiritual health and the integrity of the heart, especially when they rebuff the temptation. So I want us to look at the source of temptation today, and uh, we all know that the devil is the tempter especially as we read uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. We read this. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and from there he showed him the world and offered even that to him. So what we're seeing is that the devil is the person who comes and tempts one. You can also read that he is the tempter in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 5. But he'll always try and test the grounds of a person's relationship with God and their love of God's word. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, we note a number of things about temptation. And I'm going to read that uh, to you from my Bible in front of me now. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. <clears throat> From this passage, we note exactly what it is that the serpent, the devil, that evil one that comes to tempt us does. Verse 1 in that passage, what we saw is the serpent challenges the authority of God's word. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That was the question he posited to Eve. Now, in verses 2 and 3, we see that Eve was unsure as to exactly what God's word said about the tree. Because she responds, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, the Lord had not said um, anything in relation to touching it. The principal instruction was not to eat it. So we can see that from uh, when we compare the scripture with Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, which says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That, that's what the Lord said. He said nothing about touching the tree, only eating from it. As Christians, then, well, what do we learn from this? What we learn is we need to be completely conversant with God's word. Here it shows that she not only is unsure about what God's word said about the tree, but an actual fact added to God's word. This shows the confusion that sometimes comes upon people when they are being tempted. It also shows the confusion that they have in relation to some of the commands that we find in the word of God. 
In verse 4, the next thing the serpent did was to contradict God's word. He said, you shall not surely die. So, not at that moment, anyway. But what we can see uh, then from the above is that the devil promotes temptation through challenging God's word, causing confusion over God's word, even contradicting God's word. We can see then how important a knowledge of God's word is when it comes to being tempted. In actual fact, we all need daily a dose of good dose of God's word. You know, we need to hide that word in our hearts. We need to understand what it says so that we can confront any trial or temptation that comes our way. And the next aspect that I want to address here is Christian trials and temptations. And firstly, we must understand that temptation does not come from God. In James 1 verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You see, God will allow a person to be tempted, but he is never the means of our temptation. The temptation then provides a way in which our relationship with his, him is tested. No more clearly is this seen than in the life of Job. And I, com and I commend uh, Job chapter 1 verses 1 to 22 uh, to you. It's, it's very enlightening. But as we read this passage, we see Job is blameless and he's upright before God. He's one who fears God. He shuns evil. And if you read that passage, you'll note that from verse 13 onwards, we see Job losing all his possessions, his children, and we also see that the source of Job's problem is Satan. Now, God permitted Satan to touch Job's possessions as well as his health and as well as his wealth. And we can read this in Job chapter 1, verses, verse 12, verses 13 to 19, and in Job uh, 2, verse 7. But you, think with, you see, the thing with Job was that Job was a worshipper who would not be turned from God. And we can see that from uh, Job 1 verse 20. See, Satan's motivation was to get Job to curse God. Job 1 verse 11. He also used the only living remaining person close to him, who was his wife, to try and get him to turn his back on God. In Job 2 verse 9, his wife comes to him, seeing him in such a state uh, there, that his wife said to him this, Do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job, you see, was not the only one in Scripture to be tempted by Satan. Satan succeeded with some others. For example, he succeeded certainly with Adam and Eve in uh, Genesis 3, 1 to 11. Also in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 to 7, he succeeded. It says the devil tempted David to number the people of Israel, particularly the men, the fighting men. And David did that. And as a result, uh, we read that God sent a plague upon Israel. Some 70,000 people lost their lives because David put his faith in the number of soldiers he had rather than the, his faith in the Lord because he had been told not to number them, not to put his confidence in, in his army, but to have his confidence in God. Jesus was tempted uh, 40 days in the wilderness but he remained strong and he remained firm. So we see against these uh, Adam and Eve and David uh, failing in relation to temptation that Jesus himself, as our model, he remained firm. Now, any temptation a believer goes through may well be a trial of his faith. You see, how we react in times of trial shows the deeper thoughts of our heart. It exposes our true nature, uh, who we are and what we are. 
If we succumb to, to, to the temptation, then we must realize that there will be consequences to our sin. As I spoke about in the David example of 1 Chronicles 21, verses 7 and 14. But you know what? God is merciful to forgive if we repent. David repented and God forgave him. You see, if a person holds to his face in the midst of trials, in the midst of temptation, he receives the crown of life. That's what James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 12. So there is a reward for holding on to our integrity, the integrity of our faith in the midst of salvation. Well, let us look for a moment or two, shall we, at the nature of man and temptation. And in James chapter 1, uh, verses 14 to 15, it says, But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. But when desire has con in, is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. James, in writing this passage, is mindful of the nature of man in two ways. Man will always seek to blame somebody else for his downfallings and his sinfulness. We read this in Genesis 3, 1 to 12. But what it shows here is that whilst man may have the occasion to sin, the inclination to sin comes from within. Man is responsible for his own sinful actions and you cannot blame them on some external source. You know, there was a t-shirt that was very popular uh, years ago and it had on the front of it, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil can, talk, can uh, tempt you, but he can't make you. The choice is yours. You know, the carnal man is what draws him to war and draws us, all of us, towards sin. Here, the old carnal nature of man, that which has still not been completely dealt with, that is our habitual problems, our sinful passions, our desires or lusts of the past, when given into, they produce a yielding to temptation and therefore, if we yield to temptation, sin becomes the result. When the scripture says a man is drawn, in actual fact, uh, the Greek uh, here is, uses a term that is actual fact, a fishing term. You see, a caught fish is snared because he's gone after the bait only to find a deadly hook in it. So here, when a man goes after his own lusts and desires, he's caught by sin, and sin brings forth death, just like a fish coming out of water. Temptation, then, can come in the form of a direct attack from Satan, or more subtly, from our old carnal habits and desires that emanate from a person's old carnal nature. So when we succumb to the passions of our old nature, the result is sin. The old nature must die if we are, if we are to respond negatively to temptation. And, and, you know, we see this in Galatians 5, 17 to 21, where it talks about all of our old behaviour patterns. And you know what? Those things are put to death uh, with Christ at the cross when we have faith in him. So what are the three common areas of temptation? All temptation, we can say, fall into three broad categories. And we see these uh, listed for us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so we can parallel uh, these three categories of those things that John perceives as part of the world system with the areas of temptation. Eve was subject to by the devil.
I want us to look at Genesis 3, 6 and 1 John 2, 16 for a moment. In Genesis 3, 6, Eve saw that the tree was good for food. What does that speak to you uh, from the list of 1 John 2, 16? It speaks to us of the lust of the flesh. In Genesis 3, 6, we see that she saw it was pleasant to the eyes. In 1 John 2, 16, he talks about the lust of the flesh. This is one of those things, the lust of the eyes rather. Uh, these are one of the things that are in the world. He attributes to the world. Then in Genesis 3, 6, going back there, we see that Eve saw that the fruit was desirable to make one wise. In 1 John 2, 16, we see this identified as the pride of life. So we see three broad categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And we see how all of these were operational within Eve that enabled her to move forward and make the choice to disobey God. You see, <clears throat> broadly speaking, the lust of the flesh is the determiner of all that is self-centered, exploitative and materialistic. That includes self-indulgence of both the sexual and the gastronomic appetites, drunkenness and revelings. We also see the lust of the eyes. It promotes greed by an arousal of desire for things which are seen. This leads to covetousness, stealing, adultery, fornication, licentiousness, jealousies, selfish ambitions, murder, contentions, and hatred, all those which are the result of the flesh. What about the pride of life? How do we see this in operation in a person's life? It promotes sexism, racism, despising others, self-sufficiency, egotistical behavior, idolatry, sorcery, outbursts of wrath, dissensions, heresies, envy, narcissistic behavior. It makes pretentious hypocrites of people who glory in themselves or in their possessions. So we need to be very careful, very careful indeed. You see, people are influenced by the pride of life have a marked concern for their reputation where their own public image is of more concern than God's glory or another person's well-being. The pride of life person seeks status symbols they can ill afford through which they misrepresent themselves to the community. In James 4 verse 16 he says all such boasting is evil. That, that's a pretty good summation of it isn't it? Now Jesus was tempted in all three areas as man is. We read that in Luke 4 1 13 Hebrews 4 verse 15. So well, how did uh, Satan then attempt Jesus? Well, the first thing he, was, he did was command the stone to become bread. Jesus' response was, from the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone. And the nature of the temptation there is obviously the lust of the flesh. Satan came back to Jesus in Luke chapter 4, and he says to him, the kingdoms of the earth, I will give it to whoever I wish. Jesus' response to that was, you shall worship the Lord your God. And of course, what was offered was being the lust, of, it was, falls into the realm of the lust of the eyes. The next thing uh, that Satan tempted Jesus with, he took him up to the temple pinnacle, he said, throw yourself down from here you know, for the Lord will give charge over you. And, and Jesus' response was, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Speaking of the pride of life. So we see that just as the same areas in which man is uh, challenged to tempt, in temptation. So Jesus responded uh, to similar temptations, not identical, but similar, dealing with the three uh, natures of, of temptation that uh, John speaks about to us. But Jesus' response was always to quote the Word of God. And each episode, 
As Jesus responded with the Word of God, we see God's Word has an application to every area in which we are tempted. Find the Word and use it to meet the temptation. That's the instruction which we see here very clearly in the way that Jesus responded to his temptation. Remember, all are tempted, whether they are saint or sinner. Temptation is a strong tug on your will. James 4, 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. So we might ask then, what is the purpose of temptation? One of the things that it shows us is how vulnerable we are and how much we need God. You know, you... We need to call out to him. Another thing that it does is it strengthens us. It strengthens us in our resolve to serve the living God and to be obedient to him in all things and especially obedient to his word. It proves also the faithfulness of God and his word. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 where it says that no temptation will to overtake us such as common to man. But the Lord will with the temptation therefore make a way of escape. It's up to us to look for that way of escape. Now in James 1.12 it says that if we endure temptation it brings forth a reward, the crown of life. It also identifies us with Christ showing us to be a child of God in 1 John 4 and 4. You are of God, little children, and overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And in verse 17 of that the same chapter, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. How good is that? It helps us too to be overcomers. And in uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 9, the scripture says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust uh, under punishment for the day of judgment. So he knows how to look after us, how to deliver us from temptations. That's the God that we serve. So you may ask then, how? Can you and me resist temptation? So one of the first things we have to do is don't entertain the devil or any of his thoughts. Ephesians 4.27 tells us don't give place to the devil. Another way in which we can uh, resist temptation is by actively resisting the devil. And James Chapter 4, verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist him. He's got, tell him he has no part of you. Tell him to move on. You see, this here in James 4, 7, actively, it is us actively rebuking the devil. You have to realize that Satan's demonic followers are opposed to you and they are spirit beings. And so using the Spirit of God, address him, tell him to be gone by binding him up and loosing himself from your situation and from his influence in your life and do that in the name of Jesus Christ. For example, if it's lustful thoughts you're having difficulty with, tell the spirit of lust to be gone in Jesus' name. The more you resist, the less likely you are to be troubled. Resist until he goes then use your prayer language, the glossolalia that God has given us. That's always a a good uh, place to go, the place of praying in the Spirit. You know, there's power in that. And another thing that we can do in the face of temptation or resisting temptation is think upon good things. You know, in Ephesians 6 verse 17, it tells us to put on the helmet of salvation. And then you can give yourself too to thinking on things which are noble, just, pure, lovely and of good report. Philippians 4.8 tells us. 
The Bible encourages us to overcome evil with good. And so, you know, in Romans 12 verse 21, it uh, tells us very clear, clearly uh, not to do things that are evil, but to overcome evil with good. Another thing we can do is be regular and vigilant in prayer. We see this in Luke 11 verses 4, um, chapter 22, uh, verse 40, verses 45 and 46 of Luke. And then Luke 11 again, verses 31 and 32. So what we are seeing here is the regular prayer sensitizes a person to know God's voice. If we know God's voice, we'll recognize it speaking against any intention of our ever yielding to temptation. Now, do what Jesus did. Also, quote God's word into the situation. The devil sure doesn't like the word of God any more than he likes the name of Jesus. But Jesus did this, as we've seen and as we've spoken about, to come back the assault of Satan against him. The Word of God is an effective discourager of the Satan, of Satan. Remember, he's opposed to everything that we uh, have, you know. In uh, Ephesians 6, 17, it tells us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And in Psalm 119, I commend you read verses 9, 11 and 16. Verse 11 of that uh, Psalm 119 says, Your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. One of the things we should always do is look for God's escape route. I've quoted this to you already in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. There is always an alternative to giving in to temptation. The problem is that most people don't even look for it, despite the fact that God has promised a way out. Scripture promises that in temptation, God will make the way of escape so that we will be able to bear it. If you can't see it, if you can't see a way out, ask for it. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That We've quoted that scripture early, or I should say, it's in the plural there. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations because I can assure you, in your lifespan, you'll probably have more than one temptation that comes your way. Your way. Also remember that God does not tempt. No temptation comes from God. Why? God cannot be tempted by evil. And I refer you to James chapter 1, verse 13. He cannot be successfully tempted. His omnipotent holy will prohibits and fully resists any invitation to sin. Temptation, therefore, is not of God. But also, one of the things you need to do is know yourself. While Satan is responsible for sin coming to the world, and producing man's fall, the source of temptation is now also within man himself. Every temptation, therefore, is, is not necessarily a direct frontal attack by Satan himself, though we may conclude he's behind it. James makes that quite clear. You know, the source of temptation is just as much in man and woman themselves, because he is tempted, James says, by his evil desire. That's us he's speaking of. A person then should know his weaknesses and not compromise his position in God by deliberately exposing himself to areas of temptation. If the Lord saved you uh, from alcoholism, then the last place you need to be is where alcohol is being consumed ad nauseum. The last place you need to find yourself is in a pub, deliberately going to a place where there is temptation. Another thing that we need to be very careful of is that in the midst of call, temptation, call on God. Don't forget God when you're tempted. Remember, Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin in Hebrews 4.15. It is for this reason he is able to aid those who are tempted. 
Hebrews 2.18 tells us. So then, God becomes our refuge. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. That's God's promise. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And you can say, safe from temptation there, safe from disaster. And we can read again that in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. So I trust that you've learned something today from this uh, um, exhortation on how to resist temptation and what uh, areas a, a person is likely to be tempted in. But know this that we serve a living God whose heart is towards us, who wants to deliver us from the weaknesses that we may have in our flesh when we come to Christ. But also understand sanctification is an ongoing process and there may be times when you fall and just like David did, come to a place of repentance, get up and move on from there if you succumb to temptation. So God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again.